Well, hello, everyone. It is uh, a pleasure to welcome you here. My name is Zrinka Stahuliak. I am professor of comparative literature and French here at UCLA and director of the Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies, center that was founded back in 1963. It is great to see so many of you this on this Wednesday evening and um, coming here for our last new book salon of the academic year. Uh, this new book salon is featuring colleagues who have arrived to UCLA more recently as a way of getting to know them. And we began this series this year to be mindful of our on-site connections and relationships in virtual times. We are now 15 months into the pandemic and have finally reached the end of a full remote academic year. I am proud to say that CMRS has attained new visibility and coverage in great part thanks to the superb staff of CMRS who make this miracle of bringing us together possible. Karen Burgess, Aaron Romo, Brett Lendenberger, and Benet Frutivo. But our efforts at reaching a wide global audience also depend on Allison uh, McCann, who is manager of CMRS Publications. The center has long promoted and sustained transdisciplinary studies of the period from late antiquity to the early modern era. Since 2019, CMRS's interests spatially cover the globe, making connections beyond Europe that are true to the time period under our coverage, from Afri Africa to the Pacific Rim and to the East and Southeast Asia. CMRS also respectfully acknowledges our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. As a land grant institution, we pay our respects to the Honukwetam, Ahihiram, and Eyuhinken, past, present, and emerging. To structure the polyvalent and multifaceted inquiry of the center's diverse faculty who study various areas of the globe, we adopted five research axes. They are sustainability repurposing, fluidity permanence, bodies performance, conversion mobility, communication archive. Organized neither spatially nor temporally, but methodologically, the five research axes operate in line with CMRS's commitment to approach all areas of the world as equally epistemologically and methodologically productive, including those that have been underrepresented or understudied. Methodological connections and disciplinary intersections place unconnected parts of the world into dialogue, while they also give us a basis to contrast the knowledge of the unconnected worlds with the parallel and slow emergence of a pre-modern and early modern connected world system that begins in the periods under the purview of CMRS. Following on our first three salons on intimacy, on enmity, and on the concept of medieval and Indian performance history, today's new book salon on Professor Domenico Ingenito's new book is a fitting demonstration of CMRS's new research platform and I thank, uh, thank our three participants for availing themselves for this conversation between Persian, Arabic, and Occitan lyric traditions. Domenico Ingenito is assistant professor of Persian literature at the University of California, Los Angeles, and director of the program of Central Asia. His research interests center on medieval Persian poetry, visual culture of Iran and Central Asia, gender and translation studies, and manuscript culture. His most recent articles are Hafez's Shirazi Turk, The Geopolitical Approach, and The Marvelous Painting, The Erotic Dimension of Saadi's Praise Poetry. His new book, Beholding Beauty, Saadi of Shiraz and the Aesthetics of Desire in Medieval Persian Poetry is the spotlight of this book salon. His discussants are Marissa Galvez, Associate Professor of French and Italian and by courtesy of German Studies and Comparative Literature at Stanford University. She specializes in the literature of the Middle Ages in France and Western Europe, especially the poetry and narrative literature written in Occitan and Old French. She's the author of two books, Songbook, How Lyrics Became Poetry in Medieval Europe, and The Subject of Crusade, 
Lyric Romance and Materials, 1150-1500. She's currently working on the following projects, a transhistorical interdisciplinary study of crystal as metaphor, material and object, a monograph on the phenomenon of unthought medievalism, and finally, a co-edited anthology of global lyric. Finally, Lara Harb is assistant professor of Near Eastern Studies at Princeton University. She specializes in classical Arabic literature and her research focuses on medieval Arabic literary criticism and theory. Her first book, Arabic Poetics, Aesthetic Experience in Classical Arabic Literature, looks at medieval Arabic conceptions of poetic beauty. Her second book project, tentatively titled Mimesis in Classical Arabic Literature, for which she was awarded an NEH grant, investigates conceptions of literary representation in classical Arabic literature. She has published articles on the influential 11th century theorist Abd al-Kahir al, al Trujani, on intermedial poetry in 10th century Iraq, and the use of Persian in early Abbasid poetry. So with that, I conclude the introduction of our three speakers, and I turn over the podium to Professor Ingenita. Thank you once again for being here. Thank you so much for such a generous introduction and presentation. And thank you for hosting me, hosting us to this prestigious series of encounters. And I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very happy to be here today. This is the last presentation that I made this academic year about this book. And it started, the first, very first one was organized by CNES. And I'm so glad to be back here at UCLA and to launch this, this book uh, through a center that has changed the way we, we think about literature and the Middle Ages and the Renaissance in a global, from a global perspective or from an interconnected perspective. And thanks to you, Professor Saulyak, to bring you know to, to bring the study of the middle ages to a level that is absolutely new in in all of our fields and subfields and so i'm extremely extremely proud of, of what has been doing here and i'm very happy to to be part of this these ongoing conversations and i'm extremely humbled and honored by the presence of professors galvez and harb uh, i've known their work their work for many years i've met professor harb lara harb many years ago in new york at a conference and i've I've, I, I've learned how many subtle connections uh, one can find between Professor Galvez's work and my own investigation of the lyric space in the Middle Ages. So I, I'm, I'm extremely excited about this opportunity. Thank you again. Um, I am, today I'm, I will provide, I will share a PowerPoint in, just to, to, to show the different aspects of my book and, and then hopefully we'll have a, a productive conversations with with our co-presenters and with our our guests and 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 so we'll uh, I, I I just thought I could highlight some of the main dimensions that I tried to cover. Um, I share here my screen. So the title of the book, as Zrinka mentioned, is "Beholding Beauty." Sadio Shiraz and the Aesthetics of Desire, Medieval Persian Poetry. And it, it, it focuses on the most important poet of medieval Iran. And it focuses also on the mystery of the act of contemplating beauty. This is something that to which we can all relate as human beings, as readers, as scholars, as, as, as lovers of, of poetry and, and literature in general and the arts. And, and um, what really draw, what drew me to the poetry of Sadi is his obsession with the act of contemplating beauty from a variety of perspectives. Um, the broad spectrum of the possibilities of the meanings of beholding beauty can be found in these two lines that I selected here on the left in English translation. I thought I'd gaze upon you only once with the corner of my eye. My eyes lingered and I kept beholding him over and over. There's this transition between a you and then a him, and there's this, this sort of way of, of shifting one's gaze between a real presence, maybe an imaginary presence, maybe also, or something that lies behind the horizon of what the senses can perceive, yet admiring, beholding in pure contemplation. And another line 
Sadi says, the mystery of the inexplicable power of God shines through your face like a face appears in a mirror. I read, I read these two lines in Persian as well to give a sense of what they sound like in Persian. Goftam yeki begu shege chashma nazar konam chashmam baru bemando ziyadat magam shod. Sare galame godrate di chune lohi dar ruye to chun ruy dar aine talidast. As I mentioned, Sadi Hoshiraz, who died in 1292, was the major lyric voice of medieval Iran. He studied at Nizamiya school in Baghdad in the 30s of the 13th century and was loosely attached to the Surabardiya Sufi order. He also saw political and literary patronage throughout his life. I'm going to show a few images from about 20 manuscripts I've been consulting to for, for this work, for this, to, for this book. I've been working on it for about 10, 12 years and, and I, I, I had the chance of working on a large variety of manuscripts to redefine the biography of this poet, to reread his poetry, his major works, which are the Sadi Name or Bustan, the Golestan or Rose Garden, um, and then the collection of lyric poems that refer to in Arabic and Persian as Ghazal, Ghazal, which means originally singing for the beloved, talking. To be, to be loved in an amatory way, right? And then it developed as, a, as the major lyric form and genre in the, uh, in the Arabic and Persian tradition, especially in the Persian tradition. I've been working on the obscene poetry also, and the political connections between all these different aspects of Sadi's literary output. How is it possible to rely on all these different sources in a way that brings back to life figuratively, of course, the different ways that a medieval Persian poet could celebrate beauty through different kinds of embodiments. How, what is the role of the senses? What is the role of medieval psychology? What is the role of mysticism? What is the role of physical, even sexual interactions, right? How, how do they influence right, the, this, this, this kaleidoscopic ways that the medieval poet could have at their disposal to represent the mystery of contemplating beauty, both through the body and through a higher aspiration of the soul. And I'm, and I'm very glad that here we are in conversation with Marisa Galvez and Laura Harb, because this is something that can relate to the majority of the literary traditions that we found in the Middle Ages, in the global Middle Ages, we think. So this idea of the problem, the connection with the body and the soul, which has very specific philosophical and religious also origins, somehow intersects with a global movement of texts, the circulation texts that are not necessarily directly connected to each other, but in some cases they proceed according to parallel lines. And it's interesting to see when we discover these correspondences, they can shed new light on each other's fields, right? Through, through this kind of meditations. Um, I try to divide the book into three parts, which um, reflect uh, some sort of medieval representation of our perspective on, on the human nature. So the first part deals with the body, the second part with the soul, and the third part with performance and dancing and music and the way that the body enacts the soul through poetry. I try to see how we can start through the contemplation of the role of the body in the quest for beauty up to the sort of extreme level of extreme obscenity that characterizes some of Sadi's poetry and how from the obscene, from the political, from the sensual, we can jump toward the metaphysical, the spiritual, the divine, right? So approaching the divine, approaching mysticism without ever forgetting the role of the body, the role of the senses, the role of perception. Um, I focused on the homoerotic nature of political power, the emergence of gender desires. This is chapter number one. This is a few lines to give a sense of what the chapters are about. No one is more seductive than my beloved Turk. The chain mail of the cruisers cannot compare with his curly hair. With the sword of your gaze, you could defeat an army. Plunge your sword as no warrior can compete with you. No one is as gracious as him. 
but how one wonders that no one better than Saadi can serve Prince Saad, son of Abu Bakr. So you can see how this is a vision of political allegiance that transcends completely our contemporary modern Western ways of reading political poetry. Here we are touching the very core of the problem of sexuality and the role that sexuality and physical desire can have in the kind of negotiations that would take place in the Middle Ages when dealing with political power and the role of the poet in moving his audience or her audience in moving his patrons through erotic poetry. The second chapter uh, tries to show how lyric poetry can take shape also through narrations, through narratives that show us how, how problematic is the fine line between poetry and prose. And I focused on one of the most beautiful uh, prose works by Sadi called the, the Rose Garden, which is a sort of a autobiographical or pseudo autobiographical narration and collections of collection of tales of wisdom that Sadi collected throughout his travels, throughout his life, in his early decades of his life. And I try to see how lyric poetry tries to act as a fiction, tries to act as an embodiment of experience. So in this chapter, I try to see how amatory poetry, love poetry, was used by Sadi constantly as a way to enact his own quest for experience. There is this nice passage that I selected in which Sadi describes also the, the, the occasion that, that um, led him toward the composition of this book. The, 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 the style is extremely evocative, extremely sensual, and it's, it's very, very witty, very ironic in many cases, and, and, and also quite, quite uh, sarcastic in other passages. So I try to see how meditation on one's life in a way that is not completely different from what happened almost simultaneously in Italy with the new life, with Dante's new life, La Vita Nova, and in other literary traditions. So the, this meditation, of how does the idea and the perception of lyric consciousness emerge to the surface of interconnected literatures? And what is the role of poetry and in the connection with the, with the biography of the self? How the self emerges to its, its own making through this process? Why does it happen almost simultaneously in different parts of the world? This is a big question that, that I, I wish to discuss with all of you later. The chapter three is about obscene poetry. How does the obscene read as a countertext, as a different way of approaching the body? So we have the high courtly idealized description of beauty. How does obscene poetry belong to the same kind of process? How can it, how can it open new windows in the ways that we look at medieval authors exploring ideals of beauty through the quest of a hyper-realistic at times representation of the body and its bodily lower functions, always keeping a very high profile when using a particularly refined kind of poetic language, which, which is what characterizes Sadi's style throughout his works. This is the most polite poem that I could, uh, I could share in this context. Sadi says, hope is a dream with your intoxicating eyes. Too restless I am to sleep, sleep well and tight. How could I be fulfilled by just looking at you? I have my other desires I have in mind, but none of them can I say to you. Opening, right, the, this possibility through the imagination of the gap between realizing what the gap between actual ideals of beauty and imaginings that relate to sexual acts can be and how language can help us um, dig into experience, into to imagine experiences for a better understanding of the secret of the connection between language and, and beauty. The second part um, shifts toward the problem of the divine origins of beauty. And, and I try to, so this is the sacred aesthetics of Sadi's lyric subject. I try to rely on the Iranian and Islamic philosophical tradition and the way these traditions develop through Persian mysticism and how this mysticism 
evolved in studies poetry as a, as a joyful yet complex psychological meditation on the mystery of beauty and its divine origins. Um, there is one aspect, chapter four and five, the idea of a body, of beautiful bodies as divine signs, how to read beauty as a way that tells us, produces an inference for us toward the divine, how to recognize our lustful desires and how to tame them in order to recognize that the same sexual energy that we can use for lustful purposes can, from the perspective of these poets, can be re-read and recast on the path toward God, right? So it's a very dangerous path according to these believers at the time, because it, it, it means, it means to, it, there is a lot of stake. Faith is a stake, public morals are a stake, and, and poetic language is there trying to, to play with the lower uh, tensions of the body and finding a way to reorient them, reorient them toward the movements of the soul. Sadi says, on the page like cheek of the beautiful ones, people, they see their sensual beard. They only look at the beard of the beloved. Short is their sight, but the spiritual beholder contemplates the pen of God's creation. Everyone, everyone's eyes peruse your face with so much passion, but the self-worshippers discern no difference between truth and lust. In chapter six, seven, eight, I try to uh, dig deeper in the, in the role of the internal senses. So the medieval theories on how do we think, how do we perceive reality? How do we process things through our external senses? How do they interact with our internal processes of recognition, of meditation, of cogitation? And how do we connect with the realm of the invisible? What is the invisible world? What is this invisible, this supernal realm next to God that we could, we can peruse according different techniques? So I tried to see what ecstatic raptures meant at the time, what the recognition of a correspondence between physical sexual pleasure and metaphysical pleasure, how they could involve the importance of dreams, for instance, or, 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 or pious practices like fasting, like, um, like um, spiritual training or medit active meditation on the beauty of, of the visible world. Um, there are lines that also speak to this kind of problems. So he says, you left, but you still linger in my imagination. It seems that you are being depicted before my eyes. My cogitations cannot reach the apogee of your beauty, as you are more beautiful than anything my imagination ever conjured. The heart is the mirror that reflects the form of the unseen, provided that no rust covers its surface. So there is this, this quest for the invisible through the body, never in a fashion that overcomes or transcends the body. Unlike a poet who is quite famous in, 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 in the West, Rumi, Rumi, who, who was living at the same time of Sadi, um, in his poetry, we see, we witness how the body ought to be transcended constantly, how the purity of the soul is the main object of the mystic's contemplation. Right? Whereas in Sadi, it's so interesting that the body has to be there always to offer a kind of filter mediation that, that, that is extremely relevant when we see about, when we discover the role of the physiology of the imagination, the process of imagination and, and thinking in, in the way that we try to approach the invisible. And the third part, and I will share a few more words on this and then I'll be done. It's about performance and performativity. What does it mean to enact? What does it mean to recite the poem for spiritual purposes, for spiritual ends? What does it mean to read poetry in order to achieve a mystical rapture? What does it mean to elicit the in, uh, extreme forms of desire through the body that have spiritual ends. When I talk about this, this, this kind of um, texts and this, the, the specific topics, I usually um, rely on how modern scientists describe um, experiences with um, 
psychoactive substances like the use of, of, of mushrooms or LSD and, and in ways that reveal the, the physiology of, of what we can call mystical experiences in some cases. And, and, and it's, it's fascinating to see how medieval treatises in Persian and in Arabic would very precisely describe all the physiological effects of this kind of mystical um, experiences and, and the rapture that would be elicited by listening to music or listening to, to poetry. So it's interesting to see how poets were constantly aware also of the physicality of these processes and how they would discuss these when producing and circulating their own poetry. So this is what I tried to do with Sadi in the last, uh, in the last, in the last two chapters, foc by focusing on a specific ritual known as Sama, which I translate as lyrical ritual, um, which was widespread in medieval Islam, in medieval Islamic lands, as, as a practice to which uh, practitioners would gather together and listen to erotic poetry. And at some point, some sort of spiritual ecstasy would, would take over. And this is a, a beautiful passage that shows how Sadi's poetry was being performed a few years after his death and was also the catalyst of this kind of spiritual rupture. So I think one night I happened to be present at the gathering attended by a group of notables of the state, religious leaders, eminent aristocrats, as well as sheikhs, mystics who were popular among the commoners. So the entire society could be represented in these kind of gatherings. A poetry reciter was performing with this mellifluous voice. The resulting spiritual harmony was such that all the participants in that session, masters and amateurs alike, ended up lying senseless, each in his own corner with their clothes torn apart. Once the session was over, they all unanimously reckoned that they had never experienced such a bewildering Sama session in their entire lives. It happened that during that musical session, the reciter was reading the following line from the Ghazals of the greatest sheikh of this epoch, the most noble seeker of the truth, the most honorable among the spiritual lovers, the most eloquent liter literatus, pride of the world affairs, and so on, Sadio Shiraz, and this is one of the lines. The gaze of God's beholders does not stand for lust. You see, we go back to lust. Lust is permissible, is there, is acknowledged, is recognized, and is also an active source for spiritual quest in its own context. I'll stop here, and um, I would like to say that I'm very excited again to be here with Marisa and Lara because their their publications intersects with this work in so many different ways and i look forward to to you know to hear to hearing what what you would like to share with us thank you thank you very much great thank you so much for that presentation actually uh, domenico you included uh a passage that I was going to talk about, so that's perfect. So I'll make my make my presentation easier. Um, yeah. So I uh, thank you for this invitation to the book salon, um, and it's a great pleasure to be part of this conversation. And like Domenico, um, I also my last book um, I presented parts of it in rough versions, Rinka remembers, <laughs> um, in in at, in the center and at UCLA. So I'm very fond of. Uh, being able to present to this company. Um, I learned a lot from reading Domenico's book on Sadi, and it made me reflect on some crucial issues concerning my own work on medieval lyric in the European tradition. My main interests are the following and revolve around Sadi's aesthetic desire, the theoerotic quest, and sacred performativity. So these are the terms that Domenico uses in his book. Um, I was interested how this study of a medieval Persian poet integrates many theories and approaches concerning pre-modern poetry and theories of lyric, how a medieval poet integrates philosophical arguments of his time, inhabits the ritual conventions and spiritual aspirations of, of pre-modern lyric that often pose the struggle between the earthly and celestial or unseen realms, and how a poet translates sensory and concrete experience into a poetics of universal claims or quote, explores the subtle gaps between what exists and might, what might come into existence, end quote. So I'll, I'll be quoting <laughs> Domenico all over the place, but so that's just where you know. Um, I really appreciated how Domenico challenges facile readings of mysticism and erotic poetry by, by leading us through the poetic practice of Sadi's gaz gazals. 
Poetry is an exercise in discerning truth from sensory forms, or how the beloved is a persona, quote, suspended between linguistic abstraction and historical concreteness, end quote. Um, the study makes us aware of the philological and cultural discourses that have sustained particular readings of classical Persian poetry. And I thought that was actually really helpful as one of the things that kind of like taking up all the baggage of things that made us read certain medieval classical Persian poetry and medieval Persian poetry in a different way. Now to give you a sense of some of the people, some of the works that um, came to my mind besides the troubadours who I work a lot on are, you know, Augustine, other mystical poetry in the English and German traditions, Dante. Um, and so I was asking myself, so what how how is Sadi's poetry different, or what are and what are some convergences in the poetics? So here are some differences that that I was thinking about. So how homoeroticism works in the medieval Persian world, both as a heuristic of political power and as a mode of sensual aesthetics distinct to this tradition. It's a particular reading of the lyric I as both abstract and personal, individual and personal. Um, I also thought about the specific mode of cognition and poetry and how that operates. Um, I, I appreciated how the study in, um, looks at the influence of, of the Sufi love tradition, how I love this term, lyrical experience generates poet theory. I thought that was a really great way of thinking about that. It really is theoretical in that way, poetry as a resource in the quest for God and also as a meditative practice and how the beholder or the listener may experience a spiritual elevation without the risk of being led astray by lustful thoughts. Um, this is actually, that's um, quoting um, Domenico there. And also this idea of how the, also the listener can experience controlled rapture as well. Um, I'll just quote the sense also, I really think that the form of the guzzle is interesting to consider too in this kind of um, aesthetics of desire. Uh, a quote from the book, the guzzle grounds the entirety of the spiritual experience and be of beholding in the necessity of the lyric subject of letting the phenomenal world engulf its senses so that the superior forms of meaning may emerge from the contemplation of the physical phenomena, end quote. Now I was thinking about the form of the guzzle because it in some ways reminds me of the troubadour canso where there are these individual strophes that could be in the, that are separate almost um, but I think even more in the poetry that we were looking at that of Sadi, they're more, each one could be distinct thought experiments. Um, but then there might be a loose narrative connection or a spiritual progression. Um, but oftentimes it's not one of fulfillment. Think of the sonnet or something where there's a tone or a detournement or some kind of closure. Um, already in the Dolce Stinovo or something like that, we already see more of that contour. But here there's still this struggle. The, for, the, the, the emphasis is on the struggle um, and a question of, of how we can get to the eternal, the real truth. And, and I like how in many of these guzzles, there's a sending, there's this question sent out to the audience um, or as it says, Sadi becomes a teacher, right? He becomes a pedagogue of his congregation. It's like, look at my struggle. I'm modeling it for you. Come and follow me <laughs> and learn from me. Um, and so I'm gonna end this, my discussion also with tr also trying to get at this idea of like how aesthetic desire in the mode of the troubadours um, as I see it as a negative dispossession is transformed into an art object as a song. Whereas in Sadi, the desiring mode is sort is a, towards a perceiving truth and more of a fulfillment, more of a, uh, a plenitude or something like that. Um, maybe something more along to be read Paradiso, Dante's Paradiso, more of that kind of poetic mode. Um, so for those of you who are maybe not as versed as we are reading medieval poetry all the time. Um, one of the things to think about is the lyrical subjectivity. I just want to give a certain framework about that. So um, I think Domenico does it quite, quite well. In, in the past few decades, scholars have reassessed the nature of the lyric I in terms of um, lyric subject here, subjectivity and lyric as an event, especially in pre-modern lyric that is so governed by poet um, poetic conventions of performance. Um, and the, uh, Domenico cites um, Jonathan Culler, who has investigated the relation between his historical persona and the lyrical eye as the perception of the intimate voice of the poet. Um, and, and, and here in this study, this study considers studies gazelles as, quote, meditations between an impersonally abstracted lyric voice and their personal experience of the author, end quote. And you also reference um, Katze Hamburger, 
um, who conceives the poetic eye as a subject of enunciation whose statements are real propositions of the experience of an object. Um, the eye here is not a romantic concept of direct correspondence between lyric eye and the author of the poem, but the eye is a linguistic function and such impersonal and non-subjective, non-subjective. The lyric between the, the relation between the lyric I and the poet is indeterminate because the incommensurate nature of the exact link between biographical experience and literary creation. So I'm really I'm putting this out there because I think Domenico is really good at bringing together the historical evidence, the biographical background, but yet stay true this kind of, um, as Hamburger put it, this lyric eye that is not just a structural function, but is also informed by concrete experience. Um, and so from um, Domenico formulated Sadi's Gazals, uh, the lyric eye is and is not the literary embodiment of Sadi's historical presence. The eye speaks as if it were Sadis himself. So I think this is really kind of important to one of the claims he makes and he tries to fill it out in all in, in, in his book. Um, and also the, the idea that through other reciters of his poems, the audience acquires the eye of the text as a form of the aesthetic. And this is kind of the inhabitation of the eye as a form of aesthetic. Um, Sarah Kay in my field has worked a lot on this and in her subjectivity book um, that uh, sort of getting beyond the post-structuralist eye, um, the lyrical experience can be personal and collective. Um, so I think that's, uh, again, another important thing. So how does, how does Domenico try to kind of fill this out? I mean, I think it's really great how um, there's the, he puts in the, he really tries to flesh out the historical and social context of his world and patrons. Um, the beloved as a persona suspended between linguistic abstraction and historical concreteness. Always the presence of the body is there. It's manifests itself as, quote, the aesthetic transfiguration of abstracted physicality. Um, and the sensoriality of his depictions belong to an effect of real presence that is conveyed by the betrayal of how the lyric subject perceives the world through its eyes that are than what it actually sees. So I think the interest here is really in this kind of act of cognition. How is it operating? How does the how is the lyric acting on the reader and to get to um, you know to perceiving the body and perceiving other forms? Um, you also kind of uh, you reference Spitzer and the idea of the composite eye lyric subject as individual and universal. And, and just to give an example of the on um, in his book, he has this great example of the chase goodbye among schoolboys, and it's in the fringes of some kind of, of the Persian world. And I just love this because it, it brings in all the concrete specificity of school books, someplace outside in the Persian world, and yet it is unrequited love. It's this convention of unrequited love, the chase goodbye, which to me, studying troubadour lyric is so familiar, right? And so I just love that kind of um, example right there. Okay, so I'm just uh, I'm gonna talk about, we can go through fast through this because you did have this example of the kind of the ecstatic experience <laughs> quote, which is really great. And I was so interested in the Sama as a lyric ritual and a collective practice. And I think um, the idea behind beholding beauty is as, as a spiritual exercise manifested through the practice of lyric. Um, in the medieval Persian world, this form of lyrical ritual performed for spiritual ends is referred to as, as Domenikosh Sama, and you suggest it has a meaning as a lyrical ritual and it accounts for its poetics and its spiritual performativity. Now, I'm not gonna go read again that, uh, that ex exciting account of performance, but you have to understand to get an account like that, if we had that for the troubadours, like I would die. Like that is like the gold mine. I mean, and to know that there was a hut made or right, a lodge to make where they perform this. Like this kind of historical documentation is so crucial to fleshing out medieval performance, medieval performativity, and how it was a collective practice. Um, and, it, uh, and, and I think it's a really great argument that Sadi poetry stands at the center of the practice of Sama as a, as a collective practice. Um, quote, the performative epitome of the opposition between lust and contemplation of human beauty. The participants were offered the chance of seeing themselves as the beholders of God while meditating on their own visual approach to the contemplation of beauty. Um, I know we only have a few minutes and I, I wanna leave enough time for Lar, but I just kind of wanted to say two more things. One on a quote on, four, on page 454, there's a gazal that um, to me on the first line, on the first glance, um, reminded me of an alba, 
which is uh, the dawn song um, in the Western European lyric tradition is about adulterous love where lovers um, express the regret over the coming of dawn after a night of love. There's usually a third voice, a watchman, a third figure who announces the coming of dawn. Um, uh, there used to, there's usually a refrain of the alba. Um, there's also religious albas in which um, that go back to the fourth century of Prudentius and Ambrose in which the figure of dawn is announces the light of salvation. Now in on page 454, um, I'm just gonna read the, the just the first few lines of, of, of Sadi. How interminable is the night for the desperate lovers. Please come forth at dusk so that the gates of dawn may open. Will my peregrinations ever let me leave your hands? How could the dove flee when the falcon captures it? I love you too much. I won't gaze upon your face. The sincere lover ought to be inspired by purity. Um, so this is actually isn't an alba. One could almost say that it's um, an, an, an anti-alba because he doesn't want, he, he wants the night to end. Um, and also I could say Franklin Lewis has a really, written an excellent study on the religious and spiritual dimension of the dawn song in Persian, Arabic and Occitan. And author Hato has an excellent anthology of dawn poetry in, his, in world literature and his anthology called Eos. But why I'm, I'm bringing this up is because it provides this way to kind of make a comparison between Western secular courtly lyric and, and um, the medieval Persian lyric. And I think um, usually in the religious alba stages a conflict between the outer world of sensual form and the spiritual inner world, the soul that craves the dawn of salvation. And in the courtly um, alba, the dawn song, the courtly love, the perfect love of the courtly lovers is against the social world, the outside world that fears, and so they fear the light of dawn that announces the end of their love. Um, that's usually anticipated by the watchmen or embodied in the dawn. So even if this is not a reverse alba, or it's closer to the Latin religious alba, where one sees um, dawn as the light of salvation, I think the dawn of Sadi here is a mythopoetic time of struggle. Um, Lewis describes it as a time, dawn as a time of mythopoesis. Um, and I think here in your discussion of the song, you, you, uh, the Gaza, you just describe it as the incertitude of the lyric subject, Sadi's conflict about how to reach the pure state in which one can be with the beloved as he's battles, his state of restlessness. And he also addresses, he says, will I ever find a confident? Um, he, will I have a witness to my love? So he, he asks if his practice of an erotic poetry is entrusted to those who can understand it. So I think something that I'm interested in here is um, how the gazelle, many of these gazelles concern the desire for inner fulfillment and turmoil. Um, uh, and rather than a scene of, in many troubadour poems, the coming, um, coming dispossession or fall from unfulfillment, something taken away, I can't get the beloved. Um, and so in here, Sadi says he, he calls for his followers to bear witness, to recognize his lustful desires and the truth of loving God. Um, and the struggle of his self-improvement. Um, and so I think I, one of the things that in this chapter nine, in this part, you see this progression from his own personal struggle to bearing witness and asking his congregation or his followers to see his sacred aesthetics of, um, of, of as a communal ga gathering in which they can also in, they, take part in this ritual exercise. So I'm just gonna end here with one more thing about, um, I loved on, on how uh, he talks, um, Domenico, you talk about this tangible space of beholding the beloved and the perceptible nature which um, becomes this different levels of reality, this practice of cogitation, um, where um, he said he presents the spiritual matrix of the physical form as a challenge. So he wants to be a pedagogical guide in how one could see through the spiritual hermeneutics of desire. And um, I think one of, the, one of my favorite scholars of medieval poetry, Hugo Kuhn, was someone who tried to really understand medieval lyric. Um, but um, one of the things he was talking about is he, he describes medieval love lyric tradition as an example of how medieval art forms are objective as a lament of deprivation from the love object, such as the beloved. Um, and secular lyric as a negative performance that actualizes the practice of service that was essential formula for actual relationships within the courtly world. Um, and what he talked about it was that a troubadour lyric was a, 
was a, a as a as a musical performance um, is a, is is ad identical to its content because the content is the manifestation of courtly service as a purely physical love drive, and like other medieval art forms that express the religious content immediately without the inference of spatial illusion, such secular forms in the particular relationship between form and content is different from modern art, and so he identifies this as an objectivity of form. Marissa. Um, yes, I, I think we I'm sorry to stop you. Perhaps we can keep any of your yeah, no, I'm just comments. Gonna... Yeah. You. What I was so what I was trying to do is compare this idea of dispossession and the troubadours versus this kind of quest for a tangible for this fulfillment in this tangible space in which the the lyric subject or the poet is almost there, as you say. Um, and I think that this, um, I was going to quote a Bernard de Ventador Canso, but it's always about being something left behind, being left of that space of the beloved and always trying to get there and making performance of it as an act of ennoblement. Whereas I think for the meditative practice of Sedi is more of a trying to get to that almost and then getting beyond it. So I'm sorry to so <laughs> Yes, I just want to make sure that Laura has all the time that she to, to be able to share everything she's prepared to share with us and that perhaps we can have some time for. But Laura, please take the time you you need I'll try to, to be brief, yeah. but thank you, uh, Marisa. This is uh, really fascinating. Uh, all the connections you're finding between Persian poetry and Saadi and Tubidor poetry. Um, I wish we had more time uh, or we were together in person to continue the discussion. Um, but I, just uh, jumping off of what you just were talking about, the difference between this unrequited love in troubadour poetry and uh, the being kind of an un something negative that is unfulfilled, whereas the unrequited love in, uh, in, in Persian mystical poetry represents um, an attempt to get at the divine truth. Uh, uh, it's it's something more positive. It's uh, it's, a, it's a sign of something that is uh, in the beyond. Um, and this uh, all of these uh, images that are used. I mean, not all of them, but I mean uh, the ghazal as it uh, develops in Arabic and then in Persian has its roots in, in more secular and profane love uh, in Arabic originally. And so a lot of the things that you're describing in troubadour poetry actually exist in older, like seventh century Islamic uh, poetry, early Islamic poetry, um, especially stories like Majnoon Layla, um, which is famous also in the, the, the one who is crazy for Layla. Um, these are secular, uh, uh, representations of love and unrequited love uh, or unattainable love that then get transformed sometimes uh, very explicitly the like the story of Majnun Layla does get transformed by Nizami into a mystical um, in, uh, that love becomes a mystical kind of love in his rendition of the story but these themes of love are being you know, reused in a new way in uh, the Persian Ghazal um, and I mean, this shows the connections also between Persian and Arabic. I mean, reading this book was really a pleasure. Uh, I learned so much from it. And it's, uh, I mean, I work on classical Arabic literature, uh, but it's the same world. I, I mean, there are obviously unique trajectories that Persian literature takes, uh, but we're talking about authors that were writing in both languages, in Arabic and Persian. Uh, you, Domenico, you work uh, very closely with Ibn Sina, Avicenna, and uh, and Ghazali, uh, who both wrote in Arabic. Although they're also Persian, wrote uh, works in Persian, but also wrote in Arabic and are very influential in uh, on Arabic intellectual thought, uh, literary theory, and uh, poetry uh, in Arabic. So this is it's really wonderful how you're using um all all this intellectual production in that period uh, that applies to both uh, literatures uh, so i think i mean this book is really valuable for people working on arabic literature who are sometimes a little bit you know focused too focused on arabic 
it's really valuable to read it. Um, it's, there's so much to learn from it. The work you've done with the manuscripts is amazing. Uh, the appendix that you have with uh, with all the the Persian of the poetry that you uh, you cite is such an uh, invaluable resource. The translation somebody was asking in the chat for translations of uh, Sadi's uh, poetry. There's so much translation. There's so many translations in this book, uh, which are wonderful. So just going through the book and reading all the beautiful translations you have of uh, of Saadi's Ghazals um, is you know worth reading it in itself um, a few things that I uh, I just wanted to point out that were really interesting to me um, uh, one is that uh, the distinctness you show in Saadi's mystical um, uh, poetry and representation um, especially in in the sense uh, as compared to Rumi uh, poets like Rumi, uh, as you briefly alluded to, Rumi uh, was more uh, interested in describing the ecstatic experience itself, the, the the metaphysical experience itself. And what you're emphasizing in your book is this this connection to reality uh, that um, Sadi has throughout uh, his poetry. You you. You insist on showing, you know, the 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 physical, the physicality um, that exists in in Sadi's poetry. The descriptions of the body, the descriptions of uh, um, the insistence of uh, appreciating the physical beauty, not just um, the image of something unseen that one retains in the mind. Um, So maybe I'll jump right into my main comments and, and have a few questions. I mean, uh, this, this I, th I thought was a running theme throughout uh, the book, which I appreciated very much. I mean, this uh, focused on the relationship of Sadi's poetry with reality. So you contextualize, and you do this in very different ways. So you contextualize uh, his poetry in the historical context and the political context in his personal context, um, which, and, and you, all this information you find surrounding his poetry, um, you bring in in a really convincing way to help us read his poetry, uh, which was, which I appreciated very much. You didn't decontextualize it, you really uh, put it uh, in, in its place um, and helped us understand it better. Um, your treatment also uh, of the beloved or the shahid uh, in that you also insist on the realness of the beloved, the physicality, the materiality of human beauty as an approximation or a reminder of a supernal reality. Uh, you make a wonderful argument about the ontological reality of, of uh, mental images, both either as remnants of uh, the manifestations of seeing the unseen, uh, which then, you know, whatever you experience, when you experience the unseen, you lose, but something stays in the mind as images. Uh, and those images have a reality to them as well. Uh, but also in terms of uh, um, the role of mental images in uh, the interpretation, for example, of obscene poetry. And uh, I really like this discussion where you, uh, that you had about the difference between lyric and obscene poetry not really being about explicitness uh, but rather being about the um, reception the interpretation uh, the the poetry is licit or not based on how you are interpreting that poetry so it really depends on uh, the reader not the or the listener or the one who experiences the poetry and how he experiences it and interprets it rather than the poet himself or whether it's licit in itself or not. Finally, you discuss also uh, the actual recitation and performance uh, of Sadi's poetry and the real effects of the text itself uh, on its listeners. Uh, so even though you deal with these complex metaphysical concepts, you insist on grounding the poetry in reality as a form of interpreting Sadi. And this is what is really what I'm getting out of this book is what distinguishes Sadi's mystical approach from people like Rumi. So I have um, a question about uh, how 
the poetry itself represents reality. So is it is it mimetic? This is a little bit selfish because this is something I've been thinking about as well. Is it mimetic or is it something else? So on the one hand, you emphasize the realistic depictions of physical beauty, uh, but then you also conclude in the epilogue that uh, Saadi's Ghazals do not depict, depict political reality, carnal desire, the visible world and the realm of the unseen as, and I quote, mimetic representations of some form of truth. So, um, and you say that rather they're they're alluded to through the inspiring power of poetic language. So um, I felt that there was a um, a contradiction here. On the one hand, you're saying which doesn't mean it doesn't maybe it exists in the poetry, uh, but uh, I would like to he hear more um, what you think about this. Uh, on the one hand, you're you're emphasizing the realism of Sadi's poetry. But on the other hand, you're saying it's not, you're insisting that it's not mimetic. Related to this is um, you speak of um, aesthetic experience. So aesthetic experience, which it, it, you talk about it a little bit in, in the sense of uh, the experience of the poetry uh, when you talk about Sama, but you also talk about it as the result of uh, the, the mystical experience of the physical world or the supernal world. Um, so the mystical experience of the world is itself an aesthetic experience, um, which Sadi then tries to represent in his poetry. So is he attempting to describe this aesthetic experience again, mimetically uh, or descriptively? Or did, do you think that his poetry is trying to simulate this aesthetic experience through poetic language, trying to recreate the experience in the listener? In other words, is the listener reacting to real, a realistic depiction of witnessing the unseen uh, or to a poetic simulation that is analogous to this ecstatic experience? Um, I'll stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maurice, and thank you, Laura, for your, your wonderful comments. That I, You probably are my two best readers I've ever been in touch with really thank you it's such a pleasure and honor to be read in such in depth right so um i'll 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 um i'll respond to your question because this is really i now i have the language lara after having read your book to talk about the experience of mimetism and what it means uh what what the influence of arabic poetics could have been on the development of persian theory of rhetorics in the approach of the difference between imitation of reality and poetic fiction. Uh, this is a completely new horizon that you are opening for us, for all of us. As you say, the words are I'm afraid we lost Domenico. We'll give him a chance to come back. <laughs> Just as he was talking about my book. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, too bad. I, I'm afraid we've lost him, which, you know, is it happened almost exactly at six o'clock. I don't know if Marissa and Laura, you sort of wanted to, Marissa, perhaps say something to after Laura's comments, uh, since Laura. Uh, engaged with with your comments so if perhaps you had something to add to that while we wait for Domenico to come back. um i just wanted to sorry for the piano in the background my daughter's practicing a piano i didn't know happened to see. but um one of the things that i love this question that laura said about the question of representation because that was what i was trying to get at because we had both talked about that we're interested in this concept of mimesis as a, a reenactment of an aesthetic experience. And why I wanted to draw on the troubadours is because I thought what was going on in this, I, Domenica, um, in this, in this, in Sadi's poem is this, it's so, there's all this real tangible, real for concrete forms of the body and the presence, but then that gap, that almost of trying to get to the next level has to be created somehow. And that gap, that almost, it seems to be so different from the troubadours that create that negative space. And as a manifestation of that space, that is 
is what is the object, what I was calling Hugo Kuhn's objectivity of poetry, that it's not, that it, that, that miss that ritual is not about representation at all, but rather the performance of a neg of, of being dispossessed and stuff. And so I've just kept on thinking about it as to kind of, as a backdrop against what's happening with Sadie, because Laura's right. It's like, on the one hand, it's very, you know, full of these concrete reality of, of the times and, and bodies and on sensuality at the same time there is this trying to get to that other world so that's what i i i, it's, I think it's really useful because in medieval when we talk about aesthetic desire we tend to in medieval love poetry we tend to think it's the same thing but it's actually operating in many different ways in terms of the the the, the relation between the lyric subject and the beloved and how you know and how how what's going on there Yes, I was really intrigued too. And I think we've lost Domenico again. He, he looks <laughs> like he's coming back. But Laura, I wanted to, you know, the question you were asking, and because we've talked a lot about performance, but at some point um, you were talking about the lyric, uh, you had mentioned the lyric as, um, oh, I'm sorry, maybe that was you, Marissa, the lyric as event. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and it seems to me this question, in fact, of, whether it's representation or whether it's mimesis, whether it's simulation, the thing that we're not used to, it's something that I've been trying to think about for a while now. We're not used to sort of as literary specialists of literature to always think about the performative aspect in terms of sort of literature as action in the world. So literature as reality, not necessarily as registering reality, or, or, or trying to imitate it, but so, right, not as representation or imitation, but really as being at the starting, as a starting point of something that's gonna get enacted in the world. And it seems to me that not, not having myself read Domenico's book yet, but that that's kind of, you know, hearing your comments and engagement around this, that that partly we're talking about that. And I don't know if Domenico is back, he looks like he's here, um, we don't have his image, but do we have his voice? I just can I just follow up on this? Right? Sure. I, I really think that's correct in that in terms of the poetry acting in the world. That that's why I kept using this testing, this provocation that they think Sadie's doing. It's just like, are you are you seeing the eyebrow? But it's not an eyebrow. But like, are you going to do the right cogitation to understand the eyebrow so you can get to the next real truth? Like that's that that's what I is. You know what I mean? And I think that's the the process and I think that that's going on. I'm back. I'm back without a video. Sorry, I'm using my phone. <laughs> <laughs> my laptop crashed. <laughs> too, too many emotions. <laughs> well, we have continued without you, Domenico. I heard, I heard. I'm happy Wonderful. to have you back. <laughs> yes. And and I think I, you I were want... talking about Laura's book. And and I think yes. we, you know we need to give this to Laura. So I if you remember respond. where you were. <laughs> yes, I wanted to respond to what Lara was saying about the paradox of the contrast between realism and non-realism. This is in fact what I think is the mystery, the secret of lyric poetry, the way that both Jonathan Culler and Kathy Hamburger frame it as a discourse that seems to be intimate and real and connected to real experience, but is completely fictional. So if there is this gap between what feels like, reads like linguistically as a, as a sort of something that proceeds from the innermost feelings of a historical persona, but is not. And this staged intimacy is what constitutes, I think, the mystery of lyric in all kind of all, all, all literatures that do feature this kind of poetic genre. Um, and what is interesting to me is that the contact with reality, so this poetry, is not a contact that necessarily mimics the external world, but involves the perception of mimicry. It involves a perception of a touch of the real, of a contact with the real. This is why uh, I believe that it's extremely interesting to an analyze these processes in the context of Sadi's pseudo autobiographical narrations in the, in, the, in the Rose Garden. The way he talks about his fictional encounters or partially fictional encounters with the young man in, in Central Asia or with his, you know, in the islands of the Persian Gulf, all these narrations interspersed with um, lyric lines shows us how 
impactful the language or lyric can be to produce an effect of reality, even when reality is not there. So it's interesting to me to see how this also happens in Dante's. Dante's Vita Nova is exactly the same kind of process. We believe, we want to believe that those experiences are real, biographical, and the lyric is there to bridge the gap between historical fiction, pseudo autobiographical fiction, and the expression of intimacy given by poetic language, by lyric language. Um, I don't know, Larry, if I respond to your question with this brief comment. Yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, the question is then how, what is this representation? I mean, is, are we, do we think about it in terms of mimesis or are we, do we have to think of a completely different framework uh, to describe this poetry? Um, but this, I mean, I, I, I don't have an answer either, uh, but uh, yeah, this is something to keep thinking about, I think. It's interesting because uh, in this context, what is real is not what is seen through the senses, really, but is what is filtered through the imagination. And whenever the po poets have a connection with the invisible world through different kinds of techniques, when they talk about dreams, even, the Muhakat is the muhakat is the is the is the key word that is used. The transcription of the or or the the the, the visual transcription of the supernal reality that is all takes place in the imagination and then can more or less correspond with different levels of discrepancies with the external world. This, this is the idealistic ideal, the idealistic nature of images and perception in this context. Everything does not, nothing happens in the eyes. Everything happens in our brain, according to the Avicennian paradigm of, of intellection. Everything is translated into images and everything has to be translated into images in order to be processed. I think that that uh, shift from ideas, from the idealized perception of reality, of supernal reality, to the visions that inhabit the poetic persona's brain are what really brings together um, re reality realism and lack of realism. So it's, it's, it's in that passage. That's why that beauty is never presented the way it is to the senses. It's never really complex. It's never really detailed. It's always very um, um, surrounded by tropes, described through tropes. And the way tropes are used as tools to celebrate ideals shows us what kind of gap can, can, can take place in every single poem when those ideals are performed through the voice of the reciter, through the voice of the poet himself. In this case, Sadi keeps saying, Do not, you don't need spiritual experiences, you don't need some are sessions, you don't need to fast, you don't need to, you, need, you don't need pious oblique, just read my poetry. And my poetry will provide your senses with the experience that you've been seeking. So the realism here is in the performative nature of the poetry itself. And how poetry can simulate for us experiences that we never had. Through abstractions. But I mean, I think we are really at the heart of what everyone, we would all like an answer to this, right? Is poetry, how it even goes to where, how we categorize poetry, right? Is it, you know, it's its own genre, but is it, does it, is it in the imagination? Is it fiction? Is it reality? Is it, you know, realist poetry? Or is it completely, you know, is it mystical poetry? What, what is it doing, right? I want to thank everyone. This has been such a, uh, I don't know, going to the heart of all our questions about language and reality and the, the way we express and the images and dreams and mental images. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Marissa Galvez has unfortunately already had to leave. We are way over our time, but what has clearly emerged in this discussion is that we need to do um, a conference because an hour and 40 minutes weren't enough to even begin. So we must do a <laughs> conference on the global lyric, uh, Domenico, which we may not call the global lyric, we may just call it lyric in the world. 
uh, which will you know bring up the, all these questions on reality again i'm sure absolutely also thank you so much Zrinka, for organizing this thank you and thank you lara and thank you marissa even though she's already had to leave thank you everyone who has stayed on for this much longer hope to see you again uh, please follow us center for medieval and renaissance studies bye bye now <laughs>